Good morning, everyone. My name's Jeffrey Hotch, and I, I wanted to thank very much Casper for recognizing the importance of health economics in Casper. I think that economics is the study of scarcity and preferences and incentives, and I think if you give it a shot, you might see that these ideas could apply to the work we do in healthcare. I want to say at the very beginning that I am not speaking on behalf of any of the people I work with or any of the organizations I work for. I'm trying to portray an academic health economist. I will try to be grumpy, and hopefully I'll try to make sense as well. So the title of my talk is Aim Three Times and Cut Once. So if you've been to, say, a healthcare policy conference more than once, you're quite familiar that when anyone says, oh, we've got these three things, the punchline is going to be, you can have two of them, but not all three. So I tried to put my own spin on it using numbers. I have a subtitle of, will 67% be a passing mark? And hopefully you can see at the end of the talk why I believe economics would suggest we're only on a good day going to be able to get two out of the three. But if you believe in process utility, it's quite possible that this might be a great banner under which to march. So my main points are, one, healthcare decisions often involve other considerations besides health. For example, equity and hope, or perhaps will of a motivated minority. So there's a lot of things that go into decisions just besides maximizing health. I will also contend that current work on opportunity cost is ahead of its time. Perhaps we'll look back on the work that's being done in this field and go, wow, we really should have understood and tried to apply it later. But we're not at the crisis yet where people recognize that scarcity, like gravity, exists whether you choose to believe in it or not. And the third point I'd like to make is that no one shares the same objectives, or shall we say priorities. And you'll see why that might matter at the very end. So on to the first point. Before we're going to talk about triple aim, I thought I should really find out what that is. It's not three tubes of toothpaste. It has something to do with the patient, the population, and costs. For the patient, it's about increasing the patient experience of care, and this includes not only quality, but satisfaction. It also, as a second aim, includes something to do with the population, increasing the health of populations, and the last aim, according to the website, was a decrease in the cost of healthcare. So these are the three things we're going to try to juggle, and we'll see what economics, from an academic perspective, has to say about that. So it wouldn't be economics, right, if we didn't have a graph. It's not actually price and quantity on the axes. I thought I'd throw in a little something special. On the vertical axis, you can see money spent on my satisfaction. And on the horizontal axis, you can see money spent on the population's health. So the line indicates all the different ways we could spend a set amount of money, say $100. We could spend it all on my satisfaction and get no health for the population. We could spend it all on the population's health and maybe make me quite unhappy. From an economics perspective, there is no one right spot on that line. All we say is, if you have $100 to spend, and that's all you're going to spend, and this is a really unique insight here, all you have is $100 to spend. It's really a difficult sort of discipline, but that's basically the story. <laughs> and if you're going to spend in one area, you're not going to be able to spend in another area. Unless, of course, there happens to be some sort of joint production process by which I get a lot of satisfaction seeing the population get healthier. But in many cases, if you're going to spend in one area, you're not going to be able to spend in another area. So says economics. So this is all fine theoretically, right? But how do we make this really seem real? Well, just hypothetically pretend there's an article published in Health Economics called Willingness to Pay for Predictive Tests with No Immediate Treatment Implications. So this is a genetic test where you get information, and it's nice to know, but it's not going to help your clinician make her decision about how to treat you. How much money should we spend on that? How many hip operations should we not do so we can cover a test that provides information that has no clinical utility? 
Would it make a difference if it was coming out of your pocket? If you talk to people in the U.S. and you say to them, how much would you pay for this? They're actually willing to pay money out of their pocket. Now imagine someone else was going to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it. Stephen does. <laughs> Get two. I mean, it's a great holiday gift. <laughs> it is quite possible that people may be interested in having money spent on their satisfaction that could go to producing population health if it weren't spent on my satisfaction, it would be spent, say, on population health, and we can see this as an example. The things that we pay for that generate a better feeling in terms of ethics or more hope for the person, the cost of that from an economics perspective is the foregone health that we could have received if we had spent it in a different way. Moving on to the second point I want to make today. Uh, the first point was about opportunity cost. The second point was about actually quantifying it. So there is some fantastic work coming out of England that will be ignored here, but you heard about this work. You'll remember hearing about this work right after you ignore it. Um, the work is saying basically if you had a fixed system, call it, I don't know, I, I don't know if I should, I'll just give it initials, like NHS. So <laughs> let's say it's like on an island somewhere across the ocean from us, and they have a fixed budget, right? And something new and exciting comes along, and they decide to spend money on it. If they spend about 18,000 pounds, they will be taking away one quality-adjusted life year when they spend it on the new thing. So if they get two quality-adjusted life years, that's a good deal. But if you take away one quality-adjusted life year to buy yourself half of a quality-adjusted life year, I'm not good with the math, but I, I think that's a bad deal. So this will mean that if you in the future see some sort of drug for some sort of disease, at say $187,000 per quality. That means with a fixed budget, you are giving up 10 quality adjusted life years to buy that one quality adjusted life year. Again, I'm not good with the math, but I think we're losing health on that deal. And why is that happening? Because overall, like Stephen was saying, the values may be we want something that comes along with this new product and it may not be population health. It may be something else that we find very dear to ourselves. So, opportunity cost. Now that we know in the UK, every time they spend more than $18,000 per quality, they need to be getting more than one life year for it. Is this something that's going to change things? I think it's very important work, but I would be surprised if people are going to focus on this opportunity cost. It's an important concept, but its time is not here yet. I'd be very surprised if this sort of study were done in Canada, and if it were done, I would be very surprised if it were followed, because people have yet to recognize that we have a scarce, fixed budget. Why? Because it seems to grow each year. The year it doesn't grow, I'm not saying increases by 3% instead of 6%, I'm saying the year it stays the same, and if you're going to fund something new, we're going to need to disinvest in something else, that's when this research is going to find its beautiful KTE moment. So, in some cases, people have a little bit of challenge, like what number is it? In other cases, people just have challenge with the concept in general. It's really hard for them to think that spending in one area means we don't get to spend in another area. So I like to think about this as important, invisible work. The last point I'd like to make today before posing really difficult questions to our panel is that I feel that as an economist, a lot of economics is looking at an objective and a constraint. And if you don't have both, then you're not doing economics. So oftentimes when you talk to people, they'll have different objectives and constraints than other groups. And that's what makes policy so much fun. If we had a group, let's say, called patients and physicians, it might be that their objective is to optimize the patient and or the physician's utility or happiness. And I'm not going to get into whether it's a weighted average or completely for one of the latter groups. But they're going to do this subject to not doing terrible things for the population, and a lower priority would be cost. However, if we're talking about a healthcare payer, you might believe there is some utility in remaining within budget 
and they might want to try to minimize costs subject to a fixed level of population health. And for them, unless this person is in the newspaper, a particular patient may not be a high priority item when they're making a policy decision. The last group I'd like you to consider is the academic economists. Um, we've almost been hunted to extinction, but it's just wonderful to see a group of us here. Uh, we are thinking about it in this fashion. We're trying to maximize population health. It's subject to a fixed budget. And it'd be nice if we help patients, but overall the goal is to produce more health. These are three different ways of looking at the problem, and it's possible you get three different solutions. So how do we get everyone singing from the same page? I believe that two-thirds of the triple aim is possible on a good day unless we have a wonderful opportunity where objective functions align, that is, everyone wants the same thing, in which case then we can make progress. And when might that happen? Imagine a situation where you're trying to delist an expensive drug with serious side effects. I believe that covers it all. Then we will see triple aim in action because it'll be within everyone's objective to move on this. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is if you think you're going to use cost effectiveness analysis to save you money, uh, in general, that's not how we envision it. A cost effectiveness analysis does not tell you whether something is cost effective. It tells you the rate at which you're spending money, and to make that decision about whether it's a good use of resources or not, you need values. I would not talk to us about what your values are. If there are heter if there's differences in values, say they're heterogeneous between different groups, it is unlikely, I feel, that we'll get everyone to agree this one right way is the right way to go. The triple aim will not succeed as long as different people have different objectives. <laughs>